Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Um, it is uh, Friday, July 6th today, um, and we are going to be taking a look at the upcoming opposition between the Sun and Pluto. Uh, this opposition is really um, basically going to perfect at the time of a solar eclipse, and uh, that's happening on July 12th. Um, so there's a lot to be said about this particular Sun-Pluto opposition. It's an opposition that happens once a year as the um, Sun goes through the zodiac once a year. It's always going to oppose Pluto, so it's not something that's completely rare. We do have it once a year. We have hard aspects from Pluto four times a year with a conjunction, two squares, and an opposition. So the connection between the Sun and Pluto is um, by, by no means you know, uncommon. Uh, we see it in birth charts a lot. So um, what we want to do today is get a sense of, you know, what does a Sun-Pluto opposition look like? Uh, what is the spiritual opportunity of a Sun-Pluto opposition? And how, um, how can we understand this given that this particular Sun-Pluto opposition coming up is going to be taking place at the time of a solar eclipse? So that's our task for today. Now, just so you have the actual timeline of this, last quarter moon today. Um, so it's a, it's a nice moment to reflect on some of the themes that we're going to be reflecting on. And uh, we're beginning the process under a last quarter moon of surrendering the fruits of this lunar cycle and um, getting ready for a process of uh, uh, change that's ahead with the new uh, moon cycle that's coming because this new moon cycle officially takes us into eclipse season. So you can think of today as the, the kind of a momentum turning point towards surrender, release, letting go, things that are starting to um, disintegrate and fall away. And those themes and energies are sometimes very subtle. Um, but at a last quarter moon, you can feel the sort of deterioration of the environment um, sort of psychically and energetically uh, if you pay attention. Now, uh, coming up, this um, Sun-Pluto opposition will basically be perfecting um, early on uh, July 12th. And on that same uh, day, um, East Coast time, late uh, that day, say about 1030 or so, we'll have a solar eclipse. So it'll be more visible or more noticeable, you might say, in, in other parts of the world. I think it's only partially visible and in very uh, rare, uh, I think it's, I don't, it's, it's only a partial eclipse and it's not very visible. So, um, but we do, it is, it is part of the eclipse season. Um, so we, we do consider it one and that'll be happening later in the evening, East coast time, um, on the, on July 12th. So between now and the next six days, you basically have the intensification of sun opposite Pluto, the death of a lunar cycle and this powerful kind of new moon solar eclipse energy coming through. Now we've said this a lot before in my summer uh, previewing summer eclipses video that I did, I think it was last week or so um, that eclipses are heralds of change and they um, a, a solar eclipse is the, usually the planting of a seed of change, though in order to plant that seed, something may need to change, die, or be eclipsed. So you always have the themes of death and rebirth working very closely in astrology to the point where I sometimes joke that we need a quarter jar for every time that someone uses the words death, rebirth, or transformation, you know, in astrology because they're, they're, they're used so frequently. So that's because astrology is tracking change change is constant in this material world. The planets are the reflectors of changes in the material world, which is what we're interested in. What's going to happen? What did happen? What is happening? All of which is a series of changes. The planets, as they continually move through the sky and all of their different dances are um, reflecting those changes. So that's why we're interested in them. The particular themes though of death and rebirth, what we usually mean by them are that something is being eclipsed circumstantially something has reached a natural expiration date and it's more pronounced, it's bigger, it's, a, it's more macro than micro. Every day, every moment, there's death and rebirth. But an eclipse is a, ma a kind of a major moment of death and rebirth. And then there's different kinds. There's a new moon or a full moon. A new moon has more to do with a, a fresh new beginning where something has maybe fallen away or been eclipsed. Um, but a, a full moon, lunar eclipse, is more like a, a, an an, an an ending that has a feeling of culmination crisis or an intense peak of some kind. Now they're different qualities to the way that they feel, but they're sort of similar in what they accomplish, which is change. Now with Pluto involved in the mix of this particular eclipse um, on July 12th, 
we need to figure out first of all what is you know we know we know if you know anything about astrology you probably know that pluto is sort of the lord of death and rebirth but there's more to pluto than this so we need to dig into this a little bit um it's important one of the things i love about doing these videos is that it gives an opportunity it gives me an opportunity and i think it gives a lot of other people an opportunity to parse through um, more detailed, nuanced layers of the transits, which allow us to have different uh, nuanced layers of uh, psychic participation in the events we're experiencing. And there's the, the reason that we want that is so that we don't just end up experiencing transits as um, linear events, that they become multidimensional participatory events, which makes our lives more meaningful for a variety of reasons that I'll be talking about in a little while. All right, so let's think about the sun first. Uh, the sun is uh, a planet that was uh, has always been associated with our sense of agency. So I come into this life and, uh, you know, before you know it, someone's handed me in this modern era, someone has handed me a Joseph Campbell book, right? And, and I'm, I am now on a hero's journey. And, and mythically, I'm aware of, of the fact that I have, like, I'm on a hero's journey. It's, and that's like if you're into astrology at some point, you know, so you got you, you heard Joseph Campbell and the hero with a thousand faces and you got into this idea that you're on a journey in life, that you have agency, that you have some uh, amount of free will and that you uh, have a destiny before you, a path that you're to live, a set of ambitions that somehow define you as a character in this stage play and that propel or compel your actions. So, um you, uh, you know, as an individual in the modern era, one of the main reasons that we say, what's your sign? And what we really mean is what is your sun sign is because we are obsessed with the idea that who we are is defined by what we are doing. What, what am I doing? What are my goals? What are my ambitions in life? You know, what is my gravitational center of meaning? And how am I pursuing that? That's all solar stuff. That's that sense of everything orbiting around a core set of actions and intentions. In the New Age speak, what do we say all the time? Uh, you know, set your intentions, right? It, it's, um, or we say, you, you know, uh, are, you, are you being intentional enough? Are you living with enough intentionality? All of this is very solar. Sometimes it gets into Mars too, but, um, but it's very solar in the sense that the sun represents... Um, uh, things like kings and rulers or queens, um, fame, uh, rank, um, achievement or accomplishment, visibility and success, um, mastery and um, authority, it, you know, because in a sense, uh, most of us, and I, I speak from, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm speaking also in terms of what I see in my client practice, um, most of us feel that we are here to accomplish something. We are here, we are called to something. And there, there is a sense of destiny that we're here to realize something in terms of our actions and their effects in the world. And there's a lot of concern with legacy. Will I leave something behind? Will I do something that I'm proud of, that I can stand on, that, that, I'm, that makes me reputable, that makes me stand out? Uh, Robert Schmidt once said that the sun is about uh, selectivity, the, the select among the many. Uh, so how are you select from the city that you live in? How do you stand out? The moon would be more like your city. You're, you're, it's the we rather than the me. But the sun is that sense of me. The, how, do, how are you select within the group? So we are all living with the sun constantly in our lives. It's a kind of... Uh, basic symbol in every birth chart reading that we ever do. And uh, it's the symbol that, um, you know, throughout every day of every year, most of us are centrally concerned with, you know, and if we're, and if, and if we're struggling or we're depressed, what do we say? It's usually like, I feel like I'm not living the life I'm supposed to be living, or I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, or I feel like I'm doing things that aren't really me, or, you know, it, it all comes back to feeling like your, your life force is wrapped up in that sense of self and what you're doing. So these are very strong archetypal themes. But the sun is also related to um, uh, not just your sense of destiny in, in some, you know, 
very human materialistic sense, like, well, I'm going to be an astrologer, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. But it's also related to the, um, the uh, sense of true perception. Uh, the uh, Vettius Valens has a, a quote that basically says that the sun is the um, organ of, of uh, sight or perception for the soul. So there's also uh, uh, throughout history, the sun is related to oracles. It's related to Apollo, who is a god that was related to oracles in, in the uh, ancient Greek civilization, uh, Greco-Roman. And also um, the sun is related to seers and sages, to true knowledge and insight. Um, so, for example, one of my favorite astrologers, Richard Tarnas, if I'm remembering correctly, he has the sun and I think Pisces. And it's basically at the midheaven. He's a very masterful um, and, and reputable and sort of famous scholar, but he also has tremendous and sort of vast um, insight in intellectually and sort of spiritually. Um, I'm not, uh, of course, many others do. I'm just using his chart as an example. It's a perfect example of how the sun is not just uh, limited to fame, rank, following my destiny, my sense of agency and will and et cetera, et cetera. But it's also related to real substantive knowledge, illumination, clarity, wisdom, truth, um, and so forth. So um, uh, you can think about the sun also as uh, a, a reference point for consciousness in, in the birth chart, something that is pointing toward a sense of the eternal sense of who we are, not just the temporary sense of what we're doing, but uh, some core sense of uh, consciousness itself, that, that the sun is somehow, we, we can, you can see the soul by understanding uh, what the soul is doing. So if you want to understand somebody's soul, uh, you know, look into their actions in the world. And that'll give you some sense of, of who the soul is or where, it's, where the consciousness is at. So the sun is like that too. Uh, can point to the actual consciousness behind the intentions and actions and so forth. So we spend so much time on talking about intentions and intentionality and, and, and we're all, you know, action oriented people. And we say, we're here to live a meaningful life to craft a meaningful life. But we rarely say, well, what about the quality of the consciousness behind those intentions? And that's also the sun the sun tells us about the quality of consciousness, about where the soul is at by um, reflecting something of the soul um, in the actions, in the actions that we take uh, is the reflection of the state of consciousness. So um, those are some important thoughts about the sun. Now let's talk about Pluto. Now Pluto is sort of Lord of, of Hades of the underworld. Um, first of all is uh, sort of a, like a, a brother to Zeus and um Hades Zeus are like are like uh, like brothers, and they have this kind of rival relationship with one another. Zeus is sort of the um, the cosmic um, maestro, uh, kind of the the overseer of cosmic order, and like kind of almost like cosmic law or something like that. Um, not that Zeus is not full of his own issues, right? He he can be a hypocrite, you know. Um, puffed up and, and hypocritical sometimes. Um, but uh, there's something about Zeus, and James Hillman was the one who pointed this out, that I'm, I'm taking this from him. Uh, there's something about Zeus that uh, we all recognize in the, in the world that we live in. For example, the society that we live in is governed by laws. And uh, if you want to um, change the laws, you have to go through a process of, um, of amending and... Um, and politics to change the nature of laws. And that's basically how the order of civilization is maintained and changed over time. Um, now, uh, there is the assumption, of course, built into that, that the system is good and fair and just, and that we're sort of doing the best we can and, and so forth. Similarly, in a cosmic sense, Zeus has the, uh, Zeus sort of runs the show and we have this sense of, of fairness and uh, intelligible, rational justice, um, in, intelligible truth and order. And you can discern those things and put your faith in, in, the, in the sort of goodness and benevolence of cosmic order. 
Uh, but then you have Hades. And Hades is like the, in, in a way, Hades is like the in, inverted, uh, in, inverted Zeus. He's like, he's the ruler of the underworld. And the underworld is co-present with the overworld, the, the world above. And the world below also has a, a kind of uh, role to play in cosmic order, in cosmic justice. And uh, its ways are much more mysterious and hidden. They involve the unconscious and um, they are not penetrated by the rational mind in exactly the same way. Um, and they, they tend to deal with and address the hypocrisies in the nice sunny overworld. So, for example, um, uh, there are some weird ways in life in which uh, your pride might get dealt with on any given day. Let's say you're, you know, we're all, we can all be prideful people. Um, so let's say you're, you're being sort of prideful and um, you're, you know, let's say you're, you, you, you think very highly of yourself. You're kind of up on a high horse about something. And um, then, you know, suddenly while you're in public speaking with somebody and you're kind of up on your high horse, um, you sneeze and a huge like wad of snot like just comes out of your face and it like falls right into your mouth and you are publicly uh, it, actually you just ate your snot in front of someone while you were on your high horse and um, this other person who was sitting there listening to you was having this perception like man this person's really on a high horse and then they watch you like you know launch some snot out of your nose and accidentally eat it and they're like that's some that's some justice that's hades justice that's a, just a, just a funny like you know like so if you see someone eating their own snot on accident like that's <laughs> that's that's pluto's justice but that it get I mean, just a little example but like those kinds of things happen to us where we slip in our own pee. You know what I mean? We, we, we poop on our own toe. <laughs> like uh, Pluto's justice is such that it naturally kind of exposes, um, exposes some level of unconscious or um, uh, hypocritical unconscious depth or um, yeah, it has a way of bringing justice in, a, in, in, in ways that kind of, expose the farce that we're all dealing with in the sort of waking conscious world. It has a way of bringing up unconscious things in, in unavoidable ways that kind of poop in the swimming pool. That's Pluto. I know that's kind of gross. Sorry. But so you have this um, sense of the sun uh, and Pluto getting into an opposition with one another. You have to think about Pluto, not just as death and rebirth, but also as a form of justice, the brother to Zeus, that is uh, rooted in the underworld and in the unconscious and that will erupt in ways that take to task any kind of pride or hubris or anything that is, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, obtuse or ignorant. It will sort of expose it and in ways that uh, you, you can't make, to, you can, that cannot be made to look pretty. So it's the slip of the tongue that you have where while you're on your high horse explaining, you know, how culturally sensitive you are, you make a, a, a very ignorant or perhaps even racist remark. That's Pluto's justice. That's how Pluto exposes and reveals things that are hidden in the darkness. Okay, so you get some sense of, of Pluto. Yeah, Pluto has good sense of humor. That's the thing about Pluto is that... Uh, most of our comedians are very Plutonian in the sense that they keep pressing buttons of what we like to repress or what we like to hold down or, or whatever. And Pluto says, no, bring it up, bring it out to the light. No, light is the best, uh, they say the best antibiotic, you know, is, is sunlight. Uh, the, the best medicine is sunlight, bring dark things into the sunlight. Pluto is not just about darkness. Pluto is about exposure of, of what is dark. And so there's a, a, a funny uh, way that Pluto is always actually related to light as well. At any rate, um, so uh, when you have a sun, well, one more thing. However, it, Pluto has a dark side as well. Pluto uh, is not just, uh, sometimes we sort of glorify Pluto. Uh, maybe we're doing that a bit right now. 
Pluto can be a great administrator of of the 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 deep underworld flavor of of justice, bringing things up and exposing them, bringing them out. Um, but Pluto is also um, a planet that uh, revels in um, power and in um, uh, in undermining or in manipulating or uh, in um, uh, reveling in issues that are uh, dark. So, for example, um, if you've ever met somebody, if you've ever sat down with um, somebody who is, um, uh, let's say, very, very cynical. So, if you're if you're light, if you're happy, if you're positive, whatever, they suspect you of being insincere. They suspect you of being fake. Or they expect they they suspect you of being false in some way. And uh, Pluto can also be like that in the sense that Pluto's objective is in some ways to, um, uh, it can be, the, the sort of heavy dark side of Pluto, can be about trying to maintain power by constantly uh, uh, pulling everything down into its own dark orbit, into its own uh, inner consolidation of, of power. So, for example, another very Plutonian image is the image of a dragon sitting deep in, in a deep, dark cave filled with riches, you know, that it's hoarded all for itself. Um, one of the things that uh, we could say about someone who's just constantly suspicious of everything is though anything sunny and bright is just automatically false, or anything spiritual is bypassing, or anything um, hopeful is uh, is entitled, or and you know anything you, you get what I'm saying. That just that constant need to grab anything that is perceived as sunny and to pull it down into its own dark layer and hoard it in and use it as a source of power. Uh, that's also Pluto. So you get yeah. Someone says getting. I think someone's saying getting stuck in the in the in the mire there. So you get the idea. Pluto can also be like that, whereas Zeus can be all about faith and justice and order and, you know, the, 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 the supreme goodness and all the virtues. Uh, Pluto can point out the hypocrisy in that. Um, but Zeus also sometimes needs to call out Pluto in the sense where, uh, in the sense of Hades being potentially greedy and uh, about hoarding resources into a kind of dark um, cynical, self-absorbed, um, underworld or subterranean mode of consciousness. So when you, have, uh, when you have the Sun and Pluto coming into an opposition with one another, as they will be with this upcoming eclipse, um, you have um, a set of themes that can oppose one another in some very powerful ways. Uh, you can have the will to power in a bright and very sunny looking way that's actually very dark and intense and selfish and greedy and, and sort of hoarding and manipulative. So you want to be careful of, you know, for example, uh, whether it's yourself or someone else in your environment, a boss or some person who is basically selling you on sunshine, but deep below there's just that there's a dragon sitting on a hoard of gold, you know, that, that kind of dichotomy. So watch for that. Be careful that don't be taken in by that within yourself or within the world around you. That can be a very deceptive and power hungry. And for, in fact, many people who can be like, you know, cult leaders or, you know, this, and, and I don't mean the occult. I mean, you know, in the sense of s stealing people's energy. So there's a bright disposition, but what you're doing really is just suck, 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 sucking, taking down in, and you're, you know, you're really, the way that you take energy from everyone else is by looking at them as if they're all lost, and they all need my wisdom and my sunshine and my brightness, so, but I'm really just, just taking it all down and, and into this kind of dark, narcissistic hunger. Um, I've been around in the new age world. I've met, you know, new age teachers who are like that, and you just, you can tell from a mile away because, behind the, you listen to tone of voice. That's the most important thing in my, from my perspective. When someone is saying things that are light and bright and et cetera, et cetera, but they're coming from a position of dominance or they're coming from a tone of, that you can hear in their tone of voice that there's some kind of, kind of, some kind of, uh, perversion going on you can feel it and and i don't mean sexual i just mean there's a perversion of energy somewhere and you can you can just it's just kinky and twisted in some weird way often sun pluto 
Um, and we're and not that any of us are necessarily above it, right? Because wh- who of us are like a clean vessel 24 seven, right? So I find myself drifting into this sometimes when I teach or when I'm talking to a friend or whatever. You, it's just that that way in which you 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 try to be something light and good, but you're doing it from a standpoint of the the ego, and you're really just sucking things down into a a hungry dragonous lair. You get it. So be careful of that yourself, others watch for that. On the other hand, um, you can also see the complete transformation of like you have been, you you can, your ego can be addressed, right? So in a very positive sense, your ego can be dragged down to Hades a little bit and taken, you know, kind of put through the ringer. You, You can have an awakening experience so that you become clearer, lighter, more conscious, um, and basically a better human being, specifically because um, things from uh, deep down within that you're repressing, that you're trying to make look nice on the surface and, and presenting to the world, to you know, etc., that they can be transformed, and that, that can be a kind of an ego death moment. But um, it it can be very healthy, humbling, but you can come out with a much clearer sense of who you are and who you aren't. And that's ultimately, that's very, it's very redeeming and and a very rewarding experience. Going back to the sun as agency and sense of self and destiny and purpose. um, Your sense of destiny, a self purpose and agency can also go through a complete transformation uh, as you may need to purge or release different kinds of pent up energies, things you've been repressing. Sometimes we hide our light Though uh, I think most of the time, uh, we, my personal opinion based on how many billions of Facebook posts I seem to see about people saying that they need to shine their light more, um, I, I'm more inclined to think that we need to uh, learn how to hide it a little bit uh, or how to um, make it a little subtler. Because, uh, you know, my, my own experience of like social media is that everyone's talking, you know, I scroll through and I, I don't know, like maybe at least half of the posts I see that are of a sort of new age variety have something to do with being spectacular, something to do with shining your light, something to do with owning your power, some, you know, all of this. And I, I see most of that as really, you know, often to me, that's where I feel that sun Pluto. I'm like, oh, that's just that, that's that kind of something's not right there. And so um, when, when I see that, I'm, I'm usually thinking of, okay, that's the wounded, like that's like a, a wounded ego. Um, or it's, it's possible that, um, that we do need to shine forth. And so I'll, I'll reverse my little, um, my little criticism there and say, there may be some ways in which you, you know, this transit can have you fired up and feeling like oh, I really need to express myself and actualize more of my intentions and my will and my destiny and all of that, all of the fanfare that goes with that. But you can also um, see this as an eclipse that um, if you've been hiding in the shadows, if you've been repressing something, if you've been denying something, if you've been holding back, this can be kind of nuclear in the sense of needing to have a powerful release of energy in your life in some area and some direction. I always go back to the idea that, um, the brightest lights are oftentimes those that shine uh, brightest without drawing any attention to themselves. So how do you, um, uh, I think Michelle has a quote here. I'm going to open this up so I can see it, Michelle. Michelle says, how to shine with clarity rather than confusion. Yeah, that's a great one. Another one that I would add to that would be something like how to shine um, without confusing uh, radiance of of the soul and spirit with um, the need to be seen, the need to be dominant, the need to be liked, the need to be you know just those the the kind of hungry dragon deep inside that's can, you know put potentially throwing things off. So we have to be careful of that. But an opportunity to release something that's been pent up or to release something that that really does need to be more luminous. The fears that we have that prohibit or inhibit us. Those are real. We all have those. Um, uh, so um, another thing that I once heard a teacher of mine say was, you know that you've released or faced a fear, not when you've created some great work of art or demonstrated or performed the conquering of your fear for an audience. You know you've faced and conquered a fear when you're, when y- internally, when 
you're released from that fear, the first thing that you want to do is to help other people release from theirs. The, the call to be of service is, the, is like a strong indicator. Uh, the, the call to be of service, to offer compassionate, selfless help toward others who are suffering from their own fears and anxieties, that's a sign of having really been released from a fear. It's not usually that you're going to have a, 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 you know, a huge performance about it. Okay, so just more things to think about there with Pluto opposite Sun. Or, so, okay, so um, the other thing that you can think about with Sun opposite Pluto have to do with fathers and um, uh, uh, put the paternal or images related to um, uh, men or leaders or um, it could, doesn't have to necessarily be men, but leaders or people who are in a position of high authority. And what you're also seeing is um, betrayal of the father, death of the father, death of the paternal, the desire to drag the paternal down, um, to pull the paternal down into the underworld, especially if there's hypocrisy, but sometimes just because there's anger or rage directed toward the paternal. Um, Pluto is not always just some clear agent representing some clear agent of justice for, you know, bad men or bad fathers or bad authorities. It's also about the jealousy and the vindictiveness and the vengeful spirit of wanting to uh, harm someone that you feel is more special than you, more elevated than you, more intelligent or more accomplished, or there's jealousy in Sun opposite Pluto that can be pretty intense and the desire to destroy something that you see as up on high. So you have to be careful of that within yourself. But simultaneously, the other flip side is the desire to be self-negating or to take yourself down, uh, uh, you know, in to be masochistic, to, to, be, uh, uh, to, to try to eliminate from yourself impurities to the extent that you are somehow severe or harsh in your treatment of yourself and your ego. That's also possible with Sun opposite Pluto. So both extremes there. So um, I'm going to say a final few words. And um, I am gonna, this one's going to be under 45 minutes today, guys. I'm going for it. All right. Um, something to think about. Big picture. You know, we always, every talk that I do, I always try to say, why do we do astrology? And there's one deep spiritual lesson that I think is available to us with Sun Pluto that I'm going to focus on today. Although there could be others. Um, we're each, this is something that came out of our Bhagavad Gita for astrologers series over the past four weeks. And we kind of concluded with this thought last night. Uh, we're each born, and, one of the, and some of these come from my teachers in the Bhakti world. Um, we're each born into a field. Uh, the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita takes place on the field of Kurukshetra. And the word Shetra, as I understand it, uh, actually means field. But the word field is used in the Bhagavad Gita to denote a field of karmic activities or dharmic activities. Um, and so we're each born with a field. The field in, from the yoga philosophy standpoint comes from our karma. So from past actions, from the desires and aversions of the soul, we are given a certain a material vehicle, a body, a psychology, a, a temperament, a constitution, a family history. We're, we are born into uh, also a, a field of activities, a parameter of, uh, of, of situational karma that we're born into. Within the field that we're born into, there are, are limits and there are parameters to that field. And, um, and yet we have freedom within it. We have freedom to move about within the parameters of a certain kind of field defined by our karma. Now, you can see this in the natural world, for example, by looking at the, the kinds of fields that other animals occupy. For example, I was thinking about this last night. I had this amazing moment during my meditation um, before the Bhagavad Gita class. When I was watching, um, I was uh, opening my eyes toward the very end of the meditation, and I saw an ant crawling across my printer. And I was like, I was thinking about what we were going to talk about in the Gita series just after I finished meditating. And I was thinking, well, look at that, you know, there, look at that creature's field. Its field is significantly more limited in the, in the terms of the material space it occupies and the different things that it can do. But within its own field, like it's up to its own thing. It has its own facilities, its own limitations, its own inherent capacities. 
and it's just doing its thing within that field. So that's the, that's the ants field. My dog has a different field. What makes the human field unique? And I remember hearing the Dalai Lama talk about this um, in, a, in a talk that I was listening to some years ago. And the Dalai Lama was talking about what makes the human incarnation unique. And the Dalai Lama was saying that, uh, first of all, coming into a human form in the vast multiverse is considered um, an, ex an extremely rare and, and precious gift because we're transmigrating through many, many, many forms. And um, as we do so, coming into a human form is a bit like popping up from the below the waves in an ocean and happening to come up straight through the center of a, of a life ring, of a floaty ring. <laughs> You're we're coming right up into a life preserver. And, and the, the rarity of finding one of those in the vast ocean of material existence, all these multiverses, it's so... It's, it's thought of in many Eastern traditions that believe in reincarnation, it's thought of as ex exceedingly rare. So um, why? Because the field that you're born into, that your karma has facilitated for you, allows you certain opportunities that are just frankly remarkable. You have the opportunity to inquire and reflect upon not just your own personal nature, who you are, why you're here, what you're doing, but also upon God, reality, um, fate, destiny, the cosmos. You have the inherent capacity to inquire. And that capacity is thought of as the, as the thing that can't be wasted in this lifetime in many different Eastern traditions especially, but also in the West. In the Western tradition, that's what Socrates tells us. That's what uh, Plato tells us, Aristotle, the uh, history of saints, both men and women across many different religious traditions have told us the same thing. Um, to ponder, appreciate, wonder at, and inquire about the nature of reality is, is the part of the facility that defines all of our fields, which is incredible. You have the free will to do that. Um, I mean, of course, there are certain circumstances that are so limiting and oppressing certain fields you could be born into as a human that might make that very, very difficult. But for the most part, that's a freedom that we all have. Even if we can't read, we can still reflect inwardly. The capacity is there. So this is what defines all of our fields, that we something that we share in common. But for most of us, the way that our field is defined is in terms of like, okay, I was born into this kind of family with these kinds of gifts or skills materially with these kinds of facilities. And it's also thought that within the field that you're born into, there is a certain preordained allotted amount of suffering and happiness that you will experience through different kinds of destined events. Your, your karma has... Uh, filled your field with circumstantial ev events that are going to happen that you they have no control over. That's a part of your contract. So um, the birth chart shows us this. The, the birth chart is basically a depiction of the field that you're born into as a spirit soul. It shows you the kind of lay of the land and you have some facilities uh, within that um, lay of the land. You have some amount of free will, but there's also a lot of, you know, certain amount of preordained happiness and distress that is a part of what you're going to experience. Okay, so most of us, the point is, is that um, most of us every day, uh, we think of our freedom within that field in terms of the different choices that I have within that field to do different things within that field. Like, um, I could go and, uh, you know, tr on any given day, you might say, well, I could go and try to get a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, or I could go or try to, uh, you know, try to make money, or I could go and try to get some education, or I could, I could get really into some hobby or some interest, or I could really, you know, whatever. So we have, uh, in other times, it's just simply, how do I survive? I got to pay the bills. I got to eat food. What am I going to eat? Do I have, you know, it's like this, I got to deal with this family situation or whatever. So, most of the time, we think of our free will in terms of our ability to move within the parameters of our field. And um, something to think about that comes from yoga philosophy is that uh, this is yoga philosophy's sort of evaluation of that situation. One is that um, no matter what you do within that field, there are parameters to it. And whatever you do within that field is... Um, the freedoms that you have and how you respond or react also to the destined events that are going to take place within your field 
are shaping the next field. And what does every field have in common? Well, in this sort of, uh, you know, seemingly endless multiverse, every field can be bigger field or smaller field or whatever, um, but all fields eventually die. The solar system dies, the sun dies, the, the universe collapses eventually. And in the ancient yoga philosophy, the cycles of the universe are repeating like this endlessly through contraction or through expansion and contraction, through golden ages and dark ages, cyclically just going round and round. This is the material world. Think about it like the matrix. Think about it like a, an elaborate um, an elaborate kind of AI simulation program that we're all moving about in. And the way that you move about in any of your fields any of your in your field is the way that you define a future field but every field has the same thing in common which is that it lives and it dies so the idea is that not only is the human situation unique because you can inquire but also it's unique because as you're being forced into the same scenario lifetime after lifetime after lifetime um, eventually you may um, start to become introspective about the nature of the fields so that's the question, why am I here? What is this field that I'm in? What is my freedom within that field? Is it really freedom? Is there something else? What am I? Who is the knower of the field? Or who is the observer of the field? Um, and we start inquiring, in other words, about the nature of the field, about the nature of our relationship to the field. And we start realizing that Maybe there's something inherently dissatisfying about just, you know, uh, having a sort of uh, an illusion of free will within a, within a sort of the confines of just a particular field when anything that we do in that field won't last, when the field itself won't last, and when we just keep going through similar scenarios where the field and all of our choices within the field don't land us to lasting um, happiness but we keep seeming to arrive in new fields, uh, dazzled by the possibilities within that field, right? So this is the mystical uh, path. Eventually you say, hmm, do I really just want to keep repeating field after field after field? Am I really accomplishing anything in here? Even though I have some facility, some free will, some movement space within here, does this really feel free to me? And um, why do I have to die? And is there something else available? In fact, have I had more lives than just this life? If I'm going through field after field after field, why am I going through all of these fields, etc.? You start inquiring about that. Okay, so as you're inquiring about that, um, it's like there's a glitch in the matrix. You guys have seen the matrix movies before or whatever. It's like there's a glitch in the matrix. Suddenly you start to realize that um, this is not all that there is and that you inherently are something that is different from the form you inhabit, from the field you inhabit, and from all the choices you could make in the material world within the field that you inhabit. You start to realize you are fundamentally something different or that you can be something different. And then you start to naturally think about is there an eternal spiritual place that I could hang out where I don't maybe necessarily have to keep going through these things where you start wondering about your true nature, etc. Okay, so at that point, what happens is, and this is again yoga philosophy, is you start thinking about the how can I use the free will that I have within the field that I occupy differently to achieve a different kind of result. So you're aiming now toward a spiritual result that deepens your recognition of yourself as a spiritual being that is aimed toward the idea of a spiritual existence, whatever or wherever that might be. And your free will within your field starts becoming applied to discovering how you get there, what to do, and that's when you start finding teachers, sages, holy scriptures, things like astrology, etc. That's the this is the sort of picture of how the soul begins to potentially awaken within it within a human form. Um, so uh, the byproducts of figuring out how to use okay, so let's you so you start using your free will to you, you do have free will within the parameters of your field. So you start using it to uh, uh, awaken. That you want to keep glitching the matrix. Like, how can I keep get thing, getting this thing to glitch? Because I've got a feeling there's something else. You start meditating. You start 
you know, again, you start applying your free will within your parameters to spiritual life. Uh, there's a very similar idea, which is that, um, you know, we see often told in prison stories, whether you hear of a story from like Nelson Mandela or you see something like the Shawshank Redemption as a Stephen King novel. But the idea is that um, we all in some ways inhabit a prison, um, not to be too punitive about it, but uh, but freedom is, it ends up, has um, little to do with how big the field is that you occupy. You could be in a very small prison cell and travel the length of the universe. Uh, you could be in a very small um, prison cell and you could um, discover an eternal and abundant source of freedom because it turns out that freedom, again, is not, we constantly think of, of looking for freedom and happiness in terms of trying to expand our field, get it bigger, have more influence, have more facility within a bigger field. And we think of that as happiness, but it's not because the bigger the field is, the harder it is to let go of when it must inevitably die. That's why power corrupts, ab, you know, the, the absolute corruption of power we talk about. Similar idea. Uh, you could be in a, in, not that I would like to test the idea um, by being in a very small prison cell, but the idea is that it, it, it really, you always have the facility, enough facility is built into whatever field you have to be able to evolve in spiritual life because that's about consciousness and your will can always direct itself back to the source of itself. Your, your attention can always be turned. Your free will can always use that to turn back. That's the actual real use of free will. So at any rate, this is all again, going down the yoga philosophy path. So um, uh, this is something that I've become passionate about, but I'm not without um, uh, a sense of the, uh, social ramifications of a statement like this. It's easy to say, uh, well, you know, uh, our field and our our amount of facility or free will within a field uh, and so forth uh, coming from, uh, you know, in this day and age, a sort of white male privileged, and I mean, not like I didn't grow up in extraordinary wealth, it was very middle class, but, you know, I have certain kind of facility and certain kind of, of privileges. So I recognize the sort of danger in saying something like this at a moment like this in our, our culturally sensitive moment like this where things are very polarized. But, um, you know, I'll learn more about this because starting later this summer, I'll actually be bringing um, yoga into, I uh, signed up to volunteer um, at a local prison and bringing uh, yoga and meditation to prisoners and um, people who are incarcerated, um, the men's uh, uh, facility near where I live. And so um, I believe in this. I, I, I really believe in this and I believe that it has to be put into action in the world. It's not enough to just space out into our own containers and try to use our free will to get out of the matrix. There are lots of people suffering who don't realize that the, the facility of their free will within wherever they are to access deeper happiness, peace, to be, become aware of their own divine nature. And so, you know, if we really mean what we say that this is is what we believe in, then again, the the measure of that is uh, the ability or the desire to to be in service to others. So I feel so convicted about this that I've decided to volunteer at a prison because um, I think that that's a measure of of one's commitment to the idea, especially when one comes from a more sort of materially uh, privileged looking um, background. So. At any rate, that's just an aside. I want to put that out there because I think that's really important um, in this moment that we be uh, politically and socially active. We're not, this is not about spiritual bypassing. This is about, ultimately, this is also about compassion and teaching other people how to use real will, real facility within whatever field they occupy. So at any rate, this will tie back to Sun Pluto in just a moment. And dang it, if I can't get under an hour. Uh, the free will that we have focused on spiritual life, the byproduct of that focusing of our will on spiritual life becomes a uh, detachment from, you know, all kinds of things that are unhealthy for us. The natural, uh, you know, we are no longer naturally inclined to taking actions in the world that are based on 
perpetuating the illusion that we, what we're really doing is to use our free will to get stuff or do things within our field that will give us temporary satisfaction. So we become naturally detached from things that don't make us happy. That's a byproduct. It's not like you set out to purge your material interests. It's that you, because you start using your free will differently within your field, you naturally start to become detached from things that aren't healthy within that field. You naturally become detached from the illusion. But natural detachment is not the same as some kind of austere, harsh, or severe renunciation because you're not, you're, you don't have a spirit of antagonism. Uh, it's not about trying to rid yourself of the matrix. It's about, um, it's, it's really so much more focused on the constructive use of your free will within your field. When that becomes the focus, then the end is the means and the means is the end meaning spiritual life, uh, using your free will to turn towards spiritual life is both the means and the end, the byproduct of which is renunciation, not the focus. Um, so that means that you become someone who may not drink caffeine or drink alcohol, or you, know, you may not be someone who has a bunch of hankerings and addictions or something like that, but you're not doing it from a space of looking down your nose at anyone or anything. It's a big difference ever been around someone who's really kind and generous and doesn't have bad habits they're wonderfully inspiring to be around have you ever been around someone who doesn't have bad habits but who looks down your nose at you not fun to be around right so that's the idea we get renunciation we get goodness we get a sense of being liberated from the material world while we're in it because we're using our free will differently within the field that we occupy okay so why am i saying all of this because sun opposite pluto has the power, the spiritual opportunity is about the opportunity to reorient our use of agency and will. So that rather than continuing to follow our whims, thinking that's my free will, that's my facility, that's what's going to make me happy, Sun Pluto together as a synthesis can say, no, I'm experiencing a fundamental change of my sense of why I'm here, of what my will is actually to be used for, which is the application of of spiritual things in my spiritual life. And that can, so your, your, the ability for a death and rebirth of your entire conscious sense of who you are and why you're here in the most fundamental sense is always a, an opportunity of a sun Pluto transit. So I wanted to talk about that today because I believe that it's important to talk about the mundane level of the transit, what you might see or experience within your field, what might be destined within your field, what to be careful of, how to navigate the weather that's in the field. But then there's also why are we here? What are we doing? What is the appropriate use of any kind of agency within the field in the first place? Now, those reflect my commitments, of course, to yoga philosophy um, and, you know, my spirituality. If they don't resonate with you, that's fine. You know, I'm just personally becoming more committed to trying to talk about these things, um, uh, more uh, putting myself out there more. As the sun uh, in my own chart is moving, I'm Cancer Sun, Pluto is moving into an opposition with my Sun right now. So I share this from a space of um, the personal impact that this is having on me and, uh, and the desire to be of more service to others in the uh, kinds of uh, conscious shifts and reorientations that I've been experiencing myself. So I hope that sharing this with you inspires you um, to uh, know and feel and love who you really are in your heart and to use every moment that you have to um, mine for that gold that, that, that lives there. Uh, take it back from the dragon, you know, and, um, and, and be a clear vessel in the world for others as well. So that's what I've got for today, guys. Hey, 53 minutes. It's not so bad. It's like seven minutes under my norm. So anyway, my personal challenge is to try and get my videos down to about 45 minutes. And uh, it's a work in progress. It's going to take me a little bit because I'm a chatty a chatty person. So, um, okay. Well, uh, oh, and by the way, that desire to get it under 45 minutes, Saturn is coming in to oppose my Mercury right now in Cancer. So it's like an, a very wonderful example of the astrology. I'm trying to become more concise. Anyway, love all of you guys, and I hope that you have uh, a great week, and we'll hopefully talk to you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.